guest speakers. Glad to have back with us tonight, Pastor Ryan Jackson, who stayed over uh, today to hear uh, the man I'm about to introduce, Pastor Brady Boyd. Uh, Brady was with us uh, a year or two ago and uh, was a part of the Discipleship Summit. He's the pastor of New Life Church, this little church of about uh, 10 to 15,000 in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And we're just so grateful that he took time out of his busy schedule to come and be a part of, uh, of our church and what the Lord is doing in our lives. We, um, we're excited that he's here. Um, he is a diehard LSU fan. And, um, you know, I don't know if there's anybody else in this room that falls into that category. Uh, but, uh, you know, we were talking earlier, just the fact they won Saturday night will make him preach better all week long um, in this place. And we're grateful to have him tonight. Would you stand and make welcome Pastor Brady Boyd? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. I'm on. Did I? Okay. Is it on now? Can you hear me? All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the welcome. You may be seated. Thank you so much for Pastor Keith. I just want to say this. I was driving today, and I thought, why do I love Pastor Keith so much? I met him a couple of years ago. He's been your pastor 39 years. Can we just thank the Lord for that? I mean, that's unheard of. I'm so grateful. He was 12 years old when he he was your pastor. I can't believe that you'll let a 12-year-old be the senior pastor. Here he is 39 years later and uh, lost all of his hair. That's what you did to him, by the way. He had a full head of hair when he became your pastor. And here he is 39 years later. I love him. You know what? I was telling someone the other day, I said I was going to North Carolina to be with Pastor Keith. And I said, he, he's not on social media trying to be some influencer. He's not causing a stir just to get attention. He's got his head down, loving his people, preaching the scriptures, taking care of the people that are in front of him, and the Lord blesses him. And Pastor Keith, I honor you tonight. Thank you for being the man that you are. Uh, Here's a man that's uh, a father to many, and we need dads and moms right now, right? And so I'm just honored to be with you, Pastor Keith. uh, He's been married 39 years, right? And I've been married 35. I did get married in the seventh grade. It was a scandal of junior high, but I'm from Louisiana right? So that's what happens in Louisiana. Uh, I've been married 35 years to the same woman, though, and she's probably watching tonight. So hello, Pam. And so we, uh, we uh, have a 23-year-old daughter that works for me at the church. She does all our video and, and media. She was finished number one student at her university, so I'm very proud of her. And then I have a 25-year-old tonight that's in downtown Tokyo. He's living in Japan. So two weeks ago, we put him on a plane, and he flew to Tokyo, and he may never come back. I mean, he just loves Japan, and he's working for a ministry there in downtown Tokyo. And he, he called me the other day, and I said, what'd you do today? And he goes, I walked around town. I said, Abram, it's 38 million people there. You just don't walk around town. It's the largest city on the planet. He said, well, I just kind of walked around town. I said, anyway, I thought that was funny that he felt like he covered the city on foot one day. I think there's more to it. So it's good to be with you tonight. I want you to turn in your Bible to John chapter 8. I'm going to read to you one of my favorite stories. It's a story of Jesus coming to the defense of a woman caught in adultery. This is it's an amazing story. This woman is about to get shamed in front of this group of people. And I want you to notice how Jesus comes to her defense and what Jesus says to her in this day and age that we're living in right now. We're living in a, in a cancel culture. We're living in an age where people can get dismissed, where people pile on and dog on to people when you can make a mistake and it can end your career, it can end everything. I mean, the, the social media presence, the, the, the pressure to get it always right. And I wanna show you today what Jesus said about shame. I know if you, uh, for most of us, we walk in this room, we've all dealt with shame. We understand the power of shame, the evil that comes with shaming someone. And Jesus could have shamed this woman, but he goes a different way. I want you to read this story with me. John chapter 8, verse 2. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. Now, all right, this is something I want you to pay attention to in this story. I want you to notice how many times he stands up 
and sits down. How many times he stands up and how many times he sits down in this story. It's, it's a fascinating look at this scripture. He says, so where he, he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, these are a group of religious experts. They knew the law of Moses. They would have been highly gifted and skilled in the scriptures. Uh, they would have known all of those things, the law. They brought in a woman caught in adultery, listen to this, and they made her stand before the group. Now leave that up just for a moment. Let me ask you a question. I am not a biological expert, but the last time I checked, it takes two to tango. So the question I have is, where's the dude? Come on, all the ladies in a row, this is your chance to say, man, where's the guy in this story? The woman caught in adultery? I thought it was a couple caught in adultery. But they only bring the woman. They bring the most vulnerable person before them because they, she's the easiest one to shame. So they're bringing in this vulnerable woman before this group of religious experts. It is her worst nightmare because she's not protesting that she's innocent. She probably was caught doing something. And now her sin is made public in front of the very people that she wants to avoid in this situation. And they made her stand in front of the group. Notice she's standing, he's sitting. Now, and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Actually, everybody got stoned, not just the women. Now, I'm from Colorado. Let me stop here and tell this story because every time I read this story, I read this story uh, one time in front of Colorado. Now, Colorado is Colorado, okay? I grew up in Louisiana, but I've been pastoring in Colorado. I read this out loud and it says they, that, that this woman was stoned and there was a guy on my front row that just burst out laughing. He thought that was hilarious. And I had to stop the entire service and explain to this guy that being stoned was not what he thought being stoned was. But again, I passed her in Colorado, so you could come to your own conclusion. So <laughs> every time I read that, I think about this guy's face on my front row, laughing out loud. I decided to say this, being hit by rocks until you die. It's not what you think. Now, what do you say? Now, they come before Jesus with this question. And... The, the guys who interpret the law are asking the guy who wrote the law what to do with the law. So the guys who are interpreting the law are asking the God who wrote the law how to do, what to do with this. So they think they can trick Jesus. Jesus was present when the law was written. He wrote the law. And they're coming to question him. Now, what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap. And listen, he straightens back up. He stands back up. It's like a Catholic service. He is up and down like 12 times here, okay? So he, <laughs> they were using this question. So Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, notice he straightened up again. He stands back up. He said to them, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stoked back down and he rode on the ground. And at this, those who began to hear him, those, at those, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, and only until Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Now I have a theory about this, that all the old guys in the room, they had more sin to remember. The, those of you without sin, you could pick up a rock and hit it first. I think all the old guys in the room like me, they went, man, I have a whole, I have 35 years of messing this up. I have, I, I've, been, I've been needing grace for 35 years. That's how long I've been following Jesus. And we only followed, we were saved by grace and we're kept by grace. We are in need of grace. We can't live without grace. And I think the older you get, the more you realize of how much grace you have been given and how much more grace you have to give away. And I think the older guys in the group says, what in the world are we doing here? Picking up a rock about to harm this woman who may be guilty, but it, I need grace. I have needed grace so many times. And I think it's easier at that point to give her grace. And those, they said they, that the woman was still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? 
Where are all your accusers? Has no one, listen to this language, has no one condemned you? And this is where I know she's from the South. She's a Southern girl because she says, no one, sir. And I love that because you only hear that in the South. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So let's pray together over this. This is a powerful story. And I have a few things to share about this tonight. But Father in heaven, we know that your scriptures are continuously articulate, that they are designed to convict us, to challenge us, to change us. And we give you permission to do all that tonight. Would you come and do surgical work, do spiritual surgical work on our hearts tonight? And Lord, if for anyone in the room that has been shamed, that has been dismissed, or that's been condemned by people, Lord, we pray tonight that at the end of this message, you would lift that off of them, that you would do some holy work that only you can do, work that we can see and work that we cannot see. Would you do all those things tonight in Jesus' name? If you're okay with that, would you say Amen. Now, I want you to notice that in this story, I think the thing that I find as a dad, as a pastor, as someone who has stood with broken people all my life, I am broken. I have stood with broken people. I have stood with people that need help all my life. And, I, and when I read this story, I, every time I read it, it troubles me that they, they made her stand before the group. And I, I notice that when you read the scriptures, Jesus could have piled on here. Jesus could have been a part of the mob. He could have agreed with them. He could have led, the, led them in the, the punishment of her. Instead, Jesus never shamed people. I want you to write that down, please, and remember this. The next time you feel shame, someone brings shame to you, that is not a, the, a, something that Jesus does. Jesus never, he corrected people, he rebuked people, he challenged people, but Jesus never shamed people. He never used shame as a weapon. When Pam and I were young parents, this older couple, uh, we were at dinner with them one night. And we said, our, our little kids were like tinies, you know, like two and newborn. They were both in diapers. You know, they're like 25 months apart. And so we asked this older couple, you know, what, what they learned about parenting. And one of the things they said is that we never shamed our kids. And I said, well, tell me more about that. And they said, have you, uh, Brady, have you ever had someone say, be ashamed? I said, yeah, all the time. I grew up hearing that. Be ashamed. You should be ashamed of yourself. He said, don't ever say that over your children. Don't ever use shame as a weapon to control your kids' behavior. Shame is a powerful motivating tool. It's just also evil. And can, can you get your kids to change their behavior by using shame? Yes, but it does far more damage to their soul than whatever they were doing that you were wanting to change. Shame is an evil tool that the enemy uses. And why? Because shame convinces us that there's no hope of ever changing or getting better. Shame convinces us that we're always going to do exactly what we're doing. In other words, shame, I, tell, I told someone this the other day, shame takes away our courage. You want to take away someone's courage, someone that's trying to come out of addiction, someone that's trying to do this. You know, the, the most powerful first step for any addict is admitting what? That they need help. That's step number one. I am an addict. I need help. So what happens in that moment when they finally have the courage to confess that they need help? Somebody shames them. Somebody tells them you shouldn't do that. They say things to them that causes shame to come over. And what that does in that moment, it takes away their courage to take step number two, step number three, step number four. Shame stops the progress that the Holy Spirit's trying to help in someone's life. So that, in other words, they'll, they'll, they'll say things like, there's no use trying. I'll always be like this. There's no hope for me. I can't, I'll always do this. And that's what shame, that's a, that's a byproduct of what shame does to the human soul. And then in verse 11, I want you to notice what he says. He says, neither do I condemn you. Now, the word condemn is a judicial word. It's a, it's a word that would be used in the court systems. It was a word that would have been used if you were on trial, if you were being accused of something. You were being condemned. It was a sentence that was final. It's a sentence of death. It's a, it's a final pronouncement upon your life. It's a powerful word. When you say, I condemn you, what you're saying is that you're done. You're finished. It's over and it'll never change. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Now, later on, go to Romans chapter eight with me. Later on, the writer of Romans, 
when he's talking about the work of Jesus, listen to these words. You know these words if you've been in church. Romans 8, verse 1 says, Therefore, read this out loud with me. Can you just read this verbally out loud with me and pronounce it over yourself tonight? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen to this. Why? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, but through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Let's read that one more time. There is therefore now no condemnation. Listen, every time you feel a wave of shame come over you, the only way to get free from those waves of shame is to say, there is no condemnation over me. Christ took my shame upon the cross. Christ took my judgment upon the cross. My sin was paid for at the cross. And what I get in return because of his gift at the cross is that there is therefore now no condemnation. Why? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set me free from the law of sin and death. I can't tell you how many times in 57 years of living I've had to just stop what I'm doing and said, why am I feeling condemned? I have confessed this. I have repented of this. I have come before the Lord with an open heart because of this. And what the enemy does is he, he reminds you. He keeps reminding you of your failure, reminding you of your past, trying to bog you down in the, the, your history. Instead of talking about your future, the enemy reminds you of your history. The Holy Spirit reminds you of your future. The enemy reminds you of your history. And I'm just saying tonight, there are some of you in the room, this is, you need to speak this over your life till you believe it. Sometimes I read the Bible, and I'm going to confess something before you. I hope this is not being broadcast widely, but actually, I, I don't mind you knowing this about me. Sometimes I have to read the Bible until I believe it. I don't immediately, everything I read in the Bible I know is true. Everything in the Bible is given to me by the Spirit, but there are times in my life I have to read it until I believe it until it becomes a part of who I am, until it changes me, we have to read it and read it and believe it and confess it. And this is one of those scriptures. There is therefore now no condemnation. I, was, I want to tell you a story tonight. Um, I was preaching one time on a Sunday. I was like looking down the left aisle here. I was in my church in Colorado. I'm preaching and there's this really tall guy, like six foot seven, six foot eight guy with his wife. I'd never seen him before. I knew they were new to the church. I'd never seen them. And I just, I don't know, I don't know why I just, I mean, we have a large church with a lot of people in it, but for whatever reason, I noticed this guy sitting on the end of the aisle real tall. So after I got through preaching, I looked up and he's walking toward me, he and his wife. I said, hey, I, I noticed you out in the crowd. You know, you're he's probably the tallest guy in the room that day. And he said, yeah, I get that a lot. He said, we're new to town. He said, we come to, we're new to the church. And he said, I have a story to tell you and I'd love to take you to lunch. So we went to lunch and he tells me his story. We're sitting at lunch one day and he said, Brady, I was 18 years old and I, uh, I just graduated high school and I had a college scholarship to play college ba uh, basketball. So I was in between my senior year of high school, my first year of college. He lived in like the Memphis, Tennessee area. And he said I was in an outdoor basketball court one day having a pickup game with a group of guys that I didn't even know. But they were good basketball players. I was a good basketball player. We were playing. It was hot. It was in the summer. It's in Memphis. He said, we were all really hot and sweaty. And one of the guys said, hey, let's jump in my car. And they drove across the Mississippi border because you can buy beer in Mississippi younger than you could buy it in Tennessee or something like that. He said, there was a reason we drove into, this, uh, into uh, Mississippi to buy beer. He says, we're, we're in the parking lot of the liquor store on a beer run after playing basketball. I'm 18 years old. I have never committed a crime. I've never been violent. I've never been in trouble with the law. I've been a, a stellar student. And he says, I'm in the parking lot with this group of guys that I've only met a few hours before. And as we're walking in the door of the liquor store, this is a true story. Now, sometimes I don't let the facts stand in the way of a, true, a good story. But tonight, I am telling you the absolute truth. <laughs> this is a 100% true story. He said, I'm walking in. And as we're walking in the liquor store, one of the guys says, we're robbing this place. And stuck a revolver in my hand as we're walking through the door. All of a sudden, I'm a part of an armed robbery. He, says, he said, Brady, it happened all in 30 seconds. 
I'm walking in. The guy goes, we're robbing this place and puts a revolver in my hand. When we walked in the liquor store, the guy behind the counter realized he was getting robbed, reaches under the counter, pulls out a shotgun. He said, Brady, it was all in a 30 second motion. I lost all consciousness and I pointed my revolver to a guy, shot him in the chest and he was dead before he hit the floor. He said, I've killed a guy in 30 seconds. He goes, all of a sudden, my whole life is a mess. He got arrested. It was a trial. He got, he got sent to prison, life without parole. In a Mississippi penitentiary, he's 18 years old. He said, Brady, I was headed to college to play college basketball. I was a straight A student. And all of a sudden, in a flurry of emotion and 18-year-old, I didn't have my brain. He said, I was young. I was, I was impulsive. And I sh shot a guy and killed a man in a liquor store. So here he is serving a life sentence without a chance for parole, armed robbery, and he's in a Mississippi penitentiary. And he ends up with kitchen duty. And he said, Brady, I'm a pretty good cook. He said, actually, that was, I, that was my favorite time of the day where I could go in and cook for the other inmates. And he said, one day after several years in prison, I'm in, that, in the kitchen of the Mississippi penitentiary cooking and the governor comes and he wants a tour of the, of the of the prison and the governor walks in the kitchen and I'm cooking something. He takes a bite of what I'm cooking. He goes, man, that's really good. He goes, I'm, I need to cook at the governor's mansion. He said, Brady, for eight years, the governor's van would show up in front of the prison. I would get on the van at 6 a.m., go to the governor's mansion, cook him breakfast and lunch and dinner, get back in the prison van and go home. But I spent eight years at the governor's mansion and we became friends. I'd given my life to the Lord. He said, I went to every Bible study. I was, my, I was a, I'd surrendered my life to Christ years before. I was not the kid that walked in and killed that guy. He said, I, and I was willing to go to prison for the rest of my life because I killed a guy and I needed to serve out my punishment. But in the last two weeks of the governor's term in Mississippi, you can Google this story. It's, it's, it's on all of the, you can find the story because it was super controversial in Mississippi the governor, in his last two weeks of office in the state of Mississippi, pardoned him. And I looked at him and I said, do you mean you got paroled? He goes, no, I didn't get paroled. I got pardoned. I said, well, tell me, tell me more about that. I said, I think I know what you're saying, but tell me more. He goes, I got pardoned, Brady. You can't find a record of my wrong anywhere. It's gone. Now, you can find news stories of what I did, but my record is clean, I have been forgiven of that crime. I am a free man. I can vote. I can move about. I, can, I, am, I am free. He met, he met his wife right after he got out of prison. They are married even today. They're doing great. They're, they are flourishing. He said, but Brady, I have been pardoned. Now listen to this very much. Condemnation is a final sentence. When you've been condemned... You're in prison without a possibility of parole. That's what that word means. Now think about hearing a judge say, you're in prison with no possibility of parole. There's another young man in my church uh, that just a few weeks ago, in a moment of passion, shot and killed his wife's ex-husband. And he's headed to prison. I, was, I saw him last Sunday, three days ago. He was in my church. He's, he's out on bond, but he's headed to prison. He just heard, a, he's about to be arraigned. He's about to hear the judge say, you are condemned. So this word, when I preached this message to him, he heard this message. And he goes, Brady, I'm about to hear a judge say that to me. He's guilty probably. And this is real thing. People hear this and it is, you're done. You're over. Everything's done. But Jesus gave this woman really good news. She was guilty, but she was not condemned. Now, I want you to understand Jesus was not overlooking her sin. He was just giving her a sentence that surprised her. She was guilty, but not condemned. Now, let me just look out in the crowd tonight. There are no innocent people in this room. All of us are guilty. We're all guilty, right? We, that's why we need a Savior. That's why we need Jesus, because we can't save ourselves. We, we all came to that conclusion one day that we needed a savior. We, we tried to be God. We were terrible at it. We couldn't save ourselves. We all came to the same conclusion. We're guilty. But then Jesus looks at us and says, yeah, I see your guilt. Yes, you are guilty, but you're not condemned. 
You know how good a news that is? That you want, that's good news for guilty people. Yes, you're guilty, but you're not condemned. Now, here's the difference. This woman had been pardoned by Jesus in this story. I'm gonna give you the difference. All right, when you're paroled, a person is set free because of good behavior, but your record is never changed. You always have that looming over you, right? You always have that, that guilt present with you constantly. So you're guilty, but you're set free because of your good behavior. So if you're set free because of your good behavior, then it's your good behavior that will keep you free. You know, how, you know how awful a life that is? That's, 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 that's legalism. That's exactly what the Pharisees were talking about. If you do good things, then you get to be good with God. That's, that's living like you're paroled. Wondering if I just mess up one day, somebody's gonna come knocking at my door and back into prison, I'm going with that same sentence hanging over my head. But what happened with my friend, he didn't get paroled. He got pardoned. Now pardon is this, a guilty person is set free absolved as if never convicted. Are you catching this today? Way too many Christians are living like parolees today instead of like a people who's been pardoned. So I have some really good news. I've come from Colorado to pronounce something over you tonight. You're not, you've not been paroled by the cross. You weren't paroled by the resurrection of Jesus. You were pardoned as if you were never convicted. Your, your sin is gone. When you went into the waters of baptism, the old has gone and the new has come. A new man came out of those baptismal waters. A new person sits in front of me tonight. You're not condemned. There is therefore now no condemnation over you. The Lord has pardoned you. Let me read the rest of Romans 8 to you, okay? Because it gets better. It starts out pretty good. Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. I mean, that'll preach for hours, days, weeks, and months. But let me read verses 5 and 6 to you. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Now, we've all been there. Everyone in this room has been there doing what pleases us, doing what brings the most pleasure, right? Our minds are set on what pleases us. And he says, but we also know, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, they have, their minds change. My thinking started changing. My desires and my appetite started to changing. Why? Because their minds are set on what the Holy Spirit desires. Listen to this, the mind, and I love this language because it's, it, again, who was the person that, gave him the pardon. It was a governor. And a governor has authority, constitutional authority to grant pardons. He had legal rights to grant that pardon, but because he was the governor. Now listen to this. The mind governed by the flesh is death. The mind governed by the flesh, it's going to lead you to death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Tonight, I want to just tell you some really good news. And it starts out, you can't re believe good news until you believe bad news. Here's the bad news. We've all been guilty. With all the guilty people, if you've been guilty, would you say amen so I know who I'm preaching to tonight? I don't see any angels in the group. Now, I see some saints, and I see some very nice people, but there are no perfect people in the room. And there's no guiltless ones in the room. We've all been guilty, and Jesus did something at the cross that only the cross could fix. Jesus came to pardon us. Let me sum up the whole Bible for you, okay? The whole Bible, the entirety of the Bible can be summed up in one sentence. Jesus came to get his family back. That's the whole story of the Bible. Jesus came to the earth because he wanted his family back. And the only way to get his family back was to pardon us. He, we can't work our way toward salvation. We can't work our way toward righteousness Righteousness and salvation are a free gift that we have to receive. And that happened at the cross. So we've all been guilty and Jesus came to pardon us. Now listen to this. Here's the good news. Every single day, I want to remind you, we have the Holy Spirit. So you can have life and peace every single day. Every single day. 
I think I told you this story a couple of years ago. I'm 57 years old. I know it's shocking because I look remarkably younger than that. I know, but I'm 57. And I, when I turned 50, I, was, uh, I woke up that morning thinking, I'm probably at halftime. And actually, the way I eat and exercise, I'm probably in the third quarter, if, if I had to be honest. I don't know if I'm at halftime. I'm hoping I'm at halftime, and I'm hoping for an overtime, but I'm probably somewhere in the third quarter, okay? But I realize there are probably you know, more days behind me than ahead of me. Do you ever get that feeling that there's probably more days behind me than ahead of me? Don't y'all shake your head. You're like 18 years old. You're not, you got like 80 years left. So <laughs> this girl is shaking her head like, yeah, I know the feeling of that. Like, <laughs> so that morning I woke up and I, I had this conversation. I'm having these thoughts with the Lord about what the next part of my life. And he, I remember the question really clearly. He said, what do you want for the second half of your life? I just want more of you. I want more of Jesus. I want life and peace. I want a mind that's governed by the Spirit. That's, it's that simple. When you get older, your goals get so much smaller. And they get clearer to you, right? At the end of my life, I want Pam to love me. I want my kids to respect me. I want to be a good friend to my, the people around me. I want to be a good pastor. And that's pretty much it. I don't have any other ambitions outside of that. And that's a, a life well lived, by the way. If you can say yes to all those things at the end of your life, that's, that's good enough for me. I love Jesus. I love my wife. My kids like me. My church tolerates me. That's, that's a good life. That's a life well lived. So I'm sitting there, and he, and I, he said, Brady, he reminded me of this prayer that was prayed. We can see it like we can find evidence of this prayer 1,700 years ago. It's a three-word prayer. It's the easiest prayer you'll ever memorize. But the early church fathers taught their, their congregations to pray this prayer 1,700 years ago. And it's come, Holy Spirit. Now, I pray that prayer not because I think the Holy Spirit's run off and left me or that somehow he's abandoned me. I, re, I pray that prayer to remind myself of how much I need the Holy Spirit today. This morning, I woke up at a hotel here in town and before my feet hit the ground, before I checked the phone this morning, before I turned on the news this morning, before I got involved in politics this morning, before I got involved in anything, I said, come Holy Spirit. Now, I had a friend the other day, he said, Brady, do we need the Holy Spirit to go to heaven? I said, you need the Holy Spirit to go to Walmart. You need, you need the Holy Spirit more than you can possibly imagine. And you can't, why are you trying to follow Jesus without the Holy Spirit? Jesus didn't even tell you. Jesus said, it's better if I go so that the Holy Spirit will come. You're going to need the Holy Spirit. So, so many of people are trying to follow Jesus without the Holy Spirit, and that's impossible. It is the Holy Spirit who guides us, who reminds us of everything that Jesus taught us. It is, it is his work to help you follow Jesus. So this morning, because I want to follow Jesus better today, I woke up this morning praying, come, Holy Spirit. And see, that's a prayer that only pardoned people can pray. Because if you're a parolee, you woke up this morning saying, Lord, help me be good today. That's, that's a parolee prayer. A person that's been pardoned wakes up and says, I've already decided I'm going to follow Jesus. Jesus is mine, and I belong to him, and he's mine. So come, Holy Spirit, and help me do what I'm, I'm created to do to follow you. Pardon people pray like that. And I just want to live the rest of my life as a pardoned man, as a man that's sure of my forgiveness, sure of the grace that's been given to me. And I want to pray that over you tonight. Would you stand with me tonight? I want to pray for those of you in the room that have felt the burden of shame, have felt that shame, maybe as a parent, a coach, a pastor. Pastors are good at shaming people because it controls behavior. But that's not my mission. My mission is not to control behavior, but make you do better, do gooder. My, my mission is to introduce you to the person that can set you free. And it's, it's Jesus that sets us free. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that helps us follow him. Like I just pray over you tonight. Would you just uh, turn your heart toward the Lord? If you want to lift your hands toward him, or if you just want to just turn your heart toward the Lord tonight. And I want to pray tonight that shame be lifted off of you. That you are a daughter and a son of the Lord. Before the beginning of the world, he chose you, he saw you, he knew you, he pursued you, he came after you. And he decided to adopt you. And when you were powerless to save yourself, he saved you. When it was impossible to save yourself, he came looking for you. And he didn't give up on you. 
And so I lift and by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, I call shame off of you. I, I rebuke shame off the people of God in the room. Shame is not our master. And I pray today that the power of the Holy Spirit would settle over you tonight. Would you just welcome the Holy Spirit? Just pray that prayer with me. Come, Holy Spirit. Come to us, Holy Spirit. We, we know that you're with us. We know that you've not left us. You've not abandoned us. It's just a reminder of our need for you. And we recognize our absolute need for you, our hunger for you. So I'm asking tonight in Jesus' name that we would accept the pardon that's been given us. So I want you to put yourself in, this, in that young man's story tonight. Can you imagine? He's been in prison now for 20 years when he heard this. He had already spent 20 years in prison. And the governor comes to him and says, son, as one of the last acts that I have as governor, he said, I remember the governor handed me the paper that he had already signed, pardoned. So I want, to, I want you to imagine tonight the governor standing before you. And you're guilty. He, didn't, he, he was not arguing. He said, I was guilty. I took a man's life. I will be forever remorseful. I will be, I'll have to live with that the rest of my life. But I want you to imagine a governor coming before you tonight and giving you the pardon. And all you have to do, listen, all you have to do is say yes to it, receive it, take it from him and say thank you. That's all you have to do. He said, I didn't have to earn it. I didn't have to go do any tricks. I just took the pardon and I said yes to it. So that's the offer that Jesus has given you tonight. Yes. He's offering you a pardon tonight. Yes. Now, what do I have to do? You just have to receive it. Say, thank you. I receive the pardon. Now, I just feel like some of you just need to go through that exercise tonight and say, I received that. I've been living like a parolee that if I mess up, if I have one bad day, that I'm gonna be, have a sentence pronounced over me. And there is therefore now no condemnation over you. All we're required to do when we sin is confess and ask and repent. I mean, confession and repentance are a powerful thing, but the grace is there. All you have to do is receive grace. You don't have to earn grace. You just receive it. Amen. Just receive grace tonight. That's a, that'll set you free from all kinds, of, all kinds of things in your life. All the weight, the heaviness that comes with sin. This is the key to getting free from that. It's just saying, I received the grace of the Lord. I confess, I, I sinned, I fell short but I receive your grace. There's an ocean of grace for you to swim in. It's, it's more than you can possibly imagine. It's more than enough, I can tell you that. Can we just receive it? Father in heaven, I pray today we would receive it and say yes to it. We need grace, we see grace, and it sounds too good to be true. And it's a, it's a gift that we can never earn. It's a gift that we can receive though. And it's a gift that we say thank you for. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen, good to be with you tonight. Love you guys, thank you. Before we leave tonight, I want us to have a prayer. A lady who attends our church, Terry Hildebrand, her husband, Roger, who does not attend the church, um, is, is suffering physically. And I won't go into all the details, but earlier this evening he coded and he's in intensive care. And we just wanna believe God for the Lord to do a work in his heart. I don't know where he is with the Lord tonight, but here's what I know. I know God can do many things. He can speak life over a person who's suffering the greatest thing he can do is save someone who needs to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight, we just want to believe God for his power to be manifest over this man's life. Would you, would you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you're a healer. You are our great physician. And we lift this man to you tonight. We lift Roger to you tonight and we pray over him Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to him tonight. You would touch his heart. We pray, God, that you would do a work in his life and, God, that you would heal him. We pray for Terry tonight, that you would just be with her and minister to her. And, God, that you would just uh, give her strength as she's there 
by his side. And Lord, we believe tonight that your power is greater than anything we face. We put our faith and trust in you and we lift this man to you tonight, this precious man, and we pray, Lord, that he would experience life spiritually and he would experience life physically. And Lord, we just give him into your hands right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Tomorrow night, join us at 7 o'clock. Uh, we're looking forward to what God has to say to us. What a powerful message tonight. And, and this entire time, we've been blessed incredibly. And may the word of the Lord not fall on deaf ears. May we receive it and act on what has been spoken into our lives. Amen. God bless you. Have a great evening.